Good afternoon. What a what a wonderful conference and a beautiful facility. Thanks. How about a round of applause for our host, Millerson? Congratulations to uh, the NISC accredited centers, the NISC uh, best practices award winners, to June Williams for the Leo, Leo Lacks Award, and a special tribute to uh, Bob Pittman. We had a conversation last night over a couple of bottles of wine, so I don't remember at all, but we were, we were talking about, among other things, uh, legacy and contribution. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that Bob can check that one off uh, in terms of this beautiful facility, uh, uh, which is both. And so congratulations to you, Bob, for your leadership on this one. The, no, no, the, jets. the Jets, right. <laughs> some people are gracious winners and some of us aren't, but the Jets did win and my condolences to all of you Colts fans out there. Uh, so it, it really is a, a privilege to be here. Uh, most, how many of you, raise your hands if you're not familiar with the National Council on Aging. Good. Uh, so we are here, as we have been since 1950, to improve the lives of millions of people, especially those who are struggling. Uh, we are committed to increasing the capacity, impact, and sustainability of community organizations, especially senior centers. Uh, and we have our big, hairy, audacious goal of um, significantly improving the health and economic security of 10 million older adults by 2020. And we know that we can't do that without partnering with you, Senior Centers, and the National Institute of Senior Centers. So I'm here both as a man with a mission, uh, but also as a labor of love because I've been in this uh, organization for 20 years and the Senior Center people are always the most fun uh, and always the most inviting and always the most creative. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here with, here with you today. Uh, NCOA has a way, a, a theory of change, if you will, about how we're going to get to ten, the li improve the lives of 10 million people. First of all, we listen to you because you guys know more about the needs of older people than anybody else because they're in there talking to them every day. But from that, we identify ideas, solutions, possible ideas. Uh, and then work to bring them to scale, whether it's through community organizations, online, or through policy. So in the early days, we did the first, very first federal evaluations of the Meals on Wheels program, uh, and made the case to Congress why that should go nationwide. We did the, we ran the very first foster grandparent pilot, uh, and proved that worked and took it to scale. We've been involved in scaling programs that you've heard about at this conference, models of significant service for engaging uh, baby boomers in uh, volunteer activities, evidence-based health programs, benefit checkup, the economic checkup, uh, and aging mastery is one that you'll learn a little bit more about. So our way of working is to work with you, create solutions, and then bring them out through networks such as uh, the NISC network. Uh, you uh, have wonderful resources. If anybody here is not a member of the National Institute of Senior Centers, you really ought to be. This is a great uh, group of leaders. It's fun. Uh, we'll put you to work, but you will uh, get a lot out of it as well. We have a Center for Benefits Access, which helps uh, millions of seniors to connect to benefits to which they're eligible. Our Center for Healthy Aging, promoting evidence-based program, and Fall Free Coalition. All of these programs you can find at ncoa.org. Uh, and if you are not taking advantage of these programs, they're free resources and technical assistance. You really ought to be there, there for you to use. And by you using them, you help us achieve our mission as well. Uh, we have four uh, innovative programs to benefit checkup, which um, I had a full head of hair when I started uh, many years ago. Uh, My Medicare Matters is a newer service, 
uh, which is helping over a thousand people a day figure out uh, what to decide about Medicare and choices about Medicare. Economic checkup, where we had a session on earlier today, and the Aging Mastery Program. These are some of the things you can find at NCOA, with NCOA, and we'd love to work with you to take these programs to your communities, to your centers as well. So I'm here today to talk about the future of senior centers. And as in the, really the, one of the great joys of my job is to uh, travel around to meetings like this and meet folks like you who have um, dedicated your professional lives to helping older adults. Uh, and it's a privilege to get to know you and to have fun with you. Uh, and, but wherever I travel across the country, I pretty much hear the same thing. <laughs> Funding is down, county support is down, federal support is going, there's more competition from the businesses and the private sector, there are tremendously growing needs, uh, and yet budgets are flat. Uh, I don't know how we're going to keep up, and we're worried about our facilities crumbling, on and on. Raise your hand if you sometimes feel like this. Okay, it's okay, we're, we're in a supportive group, you can confess. <laughs> Now, occasionally, uh, when I come to conferences like this, I hear a different story. We are thriving, everything's great, we have a brand new center, a beautiful facility, uh, every, see boomers are coming in, we have, to, we have to raise our age limits because too many people are trying to get into our program. Everything's going great, the future is bright, money's coming in, uh, yeah, there are challenges, but we're rocking and rolling. Okay, raise your hand if this is you. Okay, those five people, we're going to bottle you later, okay. So, more of you are this way. Uh, and the question, and we're all, even if we're doing good, we want to do better, and even if we're doing okay, we know that we're only meeting a fraction of the needs. We know that, uh, that we know things about, that we wish more people knew about, that we could close the gap between uh, people, what people want and need and what they're actually getting. Uh, one of the uh, threats that we have is an, an article that came out this spring in Forbes magazine titled, Why We Need to Get Rid of Senior Centers. How many of you have seen this article? How many of you felt depressed when you saw this article? So let me tell you, this is a writer, let's, let's, let me read this to you, even though normally I don't read slides. To be clear, the nation's 11,400 senior centers often do a good job of offering adult daycare act or activities to more than a million people a day. They typically feature an assortment of programs and services including meals, health and fitness and volunteer opportunities, educational and art programs, and of course, bingo. And compared to their, with their peers, senior center participants generally have high, higher levels of health, social interaction, and life satisfaction, according to the NCOA. But senior centers tend to have the same stifly stodgy, old age vibe my mind found at an assisted living community. This is a national magazine writing uh, the perception of senior centers. Don't worry, Ma I, I, Maureen, I sicked Maureen on her and we, we talked to the reporter afterwards and, and straightened her out. But this is a prevailing view that, uh, that something that is, we really have to pay attention to. So, of course, what we said to the reporter and actually the re editor, the reporter's boss, uh, that we know differently. So, I, you know, one of the, um, I got into, one of the reasons I got into this field, that probably the reason three quarters of us got into the field is because we had our grandparents living with us at some point. Have, raise your hand if you live with your grandparents at some point. Oh, only 10% of us in this group. Anyway, um, but another one is I have a hearing loss, so I don't know when I'm loud and I'm soft. So you're telling me I'm okay now? Perfect. Perfect, oh, okay, thanks. So we told the reporters that we know senior centers are critical uh, and we know that they need to modernize and in fact many of them are and you've been hearing about that for the last two days. Incredible energy, excitement, innovation uh, and yet we all know there's more to do. 
So I'm here today to provide a couple of things, a little bit of context, uh, some strategy, and some things. And by the way, if, don't take notes. Have, raise your hand if you're a compulsive note taker. <laughs> okay, try to sit on your hands. If you can't, first of all, you have this presentation that's been given to you. So if you have to, you can, but um, you don't need to, is what I want to say. So the context very quickly, you all know this, how rapidly the uh, population is growing, the number of people over 65 will, will double, the number of people over 85 will triple, the number of people over 100 will increase by six times. And all of these projections, by the way, assume no major biomedical break breakthroughs, and the only thing I can guarantee that will happen is there will be major biomedical breakthroughs. So these, uh, we know this, you're living it every day, I don't need to tell you that we have 10,000 people a day uh, coming into a phase of life that they're really unprepared for. We're also, and Colin Milner talked about this yesterday in a different way, but we also have this gift of longevity. In 1950, when I was born and my grandfather turned 65, the average male would live for 13 years, about six and a half in good health. So that meant if you're retiring at 65, on average, you'd live to 71, 72 in good health, and then five years of not so good health. And so when you have five years ahead of you, it's when you travel, go to Florida, do all those kinds of things. Next year, when I retire at 65, the average male will live for 19 years, more till 84, of which 14 years will be good in good health. And this is even more dramatic from women. My grandmother, would, at, in, in 1950, would live for 16 years, about eight years in good health. Uh, today, a woman turning 65 will live for 21 years, about 15 of them in good health. But we're still in this paradigm of retirement, which was our grandfather's, which was the purpose of the first period of our life up to 18 or 21 is about learning, the next phase is about working, uh, and then the next phase is about leisure. So you have all these people, and I see them every day, my high school buddies and people who retire, and I say, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to take it easy. And, and, I, and I say to them, well, do you realize, to, to the women, you have 16 years, uh, and no matter how much you, that's a lot of time. That's if you, by the way, if you put these two things together, of 70 million people over the age of, of 65, the 15 years on average of good health, that in the next 15 years is more than 1 billion years of good health. 1 billion years that we collectively, as a country, in our age group have, and what are we going to do with that time? This is the big uh, unknown for individuals. It's a big unknown for the country. Uh, and it's where I think, as I'll talk later, it's a tremendous opportunity. But what are people doing with their time right now? If you look at the blue line, this is on the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it says people in the 65 to 74 age group, most of whom are in good health, most of who are relatively good health, able to do things. They're spending almost nine hours a day sleeping, or more likely trying to sleep, uh, back and forth. They're spending about seven hours a day in leisure, four and a half or five, which is watching television. Uh, they're spending a couple hours on household activities, uh, and this is numbers kind of skewed because either they're working or they're not and if they most of them aren't working and those who aren't working you know maybe spend you know maybe less 20 minutes a day on average or two hours a week in work or ser volunteer service related activity so we've got a lot of time uh, and it's not that people aren't busy and it's not that people aren't filling it up but this is a huge resource uh, and an opportunity uh, and uh, just the other thing we have going, of course, we all know about is that health care costs in this country are out of control, especially for older people. And we all know kind of the data that um, we spend twice as much on health care per person as any other country, uh, but get, um, we don't get particularly good results. But actually, it's really much more dramatic than that because up until, the compare this, this line, compare spending per capita to Germany, Britain, Sweden, and Spain, and actually we spend about the same amount per capita on people up till age 57. Now it's, it's 
not as evenly distributed. We have more, you know, it, it's not as fairly distributed. But what happens after age 57, which is about when chronic diseases start to kick in, uh, we go skyrocketing off the chart to the point that we're spending twice as much at age 67, three times as much per capita at 77, and four times as much uh, at eight, over at 87. Now, this is a combination of things. It's the fact that we're not as healthy uh, when we get to these ages. It's that health care is expensive in this country. It's also because we spend a lot at the end of life, uh, not always in productive cases. But this creates, among other things, a national imperative, a national reason for why we, want to we need to help people be as, health as healthy as possible. So how many of you have done SWOT analyses at some point? Good. All right. So we're going to do a mega one for senior centers here. Quickly, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So what are some of the strengths of senior centers? That, <laughs> all right, all right. One of them is that, now this is, a, I can't even, I've never known senior center people to be such, so I'm going to help you, okay. Uh, I'm not going to help you because my computer's not working. Yeah, uh, why is it going this way? Wait a minute. Okay, I'm making it easy for you. This is like a slow class, we got to give them the prompts. Okay. So the strengths are, you have a facility, a location. Some, sometimes, like this, it's a great strength. Sometimes it's a little strength, okay. You have a history in your community of serving people that gives you credibility. You have a knowledge uh, base, which I think we often underestimate. But I have all these people coming to me all the time and say, hey, guess what? There are a lot of people are growing old <laughs> and uh, they have needs. <laughs> and uh, oh, I go, oh, really? And. Uh, <laughs> So you guys know that. You have a base of participants. You have current programs. You have current funding stream. You have a board. You have a staff. These are all uh, strengths and assets. What else do you have? Volunteers. I didn't hear it, what'd you say? Volunteers. Volunteers, right, great. Okay, great. Uh, you can add to this list. Volunteers, obviously, it's a great, it's a great one. Some of you have some weaknesses. Funding is limited. Who has too much, too much money? Uh, most of who has, who doesn't have a large endowment? Well, who has a large endowment? Who's not answering the questions? A lot of you, okay. <laughs> okay, some, a few of us have large endowment. The restricted nature of the funding, particularly from government and foundation, you can't do what you want to do, you have to do what they want you to do, and hopefully there's some overlap, but often there's not en enough. Another weakness, is, which I'm going to talk more about later, is your brand. How are you perceived? Uh, and more cases than not, that's a, that's a weakness. Uh, your current older participants can be a strength or that can be a weakness. If your participants all look like the senior center where the Forbes reporter went and it looks like an adult day program, that can be a weakness in terms of attracting other population. Your services and programs might also be a weakness if they're all uh, uh, social services focused on frail people or only to uh, low income population. What other weaknesses? What Hmm? Yeah. What other, any other weaknesses? Image. Say it again. Image. Image, okay. Brand, yes. Don't own our own Okay. Great. Yes, Diane. Oh, that isn't that funny. People in government think they're not in control of what they do. <laughs> Some of us in the private sector think we're not in control of what we do either, but well, okay. Great, so we have some strengths, we have some, some weaknesses, we have some threats. Who's having threats of funding cuts? Raise your hand if you have that. Competition from for-profit businesses coming in to offer, how many of you have that? 
competition from other nonprofits, YMCA's and others. How many of you have that? The rules and regulations. Ah, oh, that got a big one, okay. What else? Other threats. Okay. You also, the good news is there are also some opportunities in this equation. Number one, you got demographics. More people coming every day who may not know they need you. They may not, but you know they need you. You know that the issues that they face. The Affordable Care Act, with its emphasis on uh, management of chronic disease, on an outcome, presents tremendous opportunity uh, if we can figure out how to crack into them, tap into them. The growing recognition that health care and staying healthy is about managing chronic illnesses and that 90% of chronic illnesses is about behaviors uh, is again placed to our strength. New technologies which make it easier for us to reach and serve people. Great as opportunity as NCOA, NISC programs and services. I get a point for that, Maureen, right? Thank you. Uh, and what other strength, what other opportunities? Partnerships, okay. Great. Okay, so this is just a background gestalt, all just keep in the back of your mind. Now uh, we're going to talk about strategies to transform senior centers. And just in part to make sure that you pay attention, and in part because my thinking evolves, there are actually going to be 11 strategies, not nine. So uh, most of this, will be, well, all of this is in the PowerPoint. So the first strategy. I think applies for probably for all nonprofits, definitely for all nonprofits in the field of aging, but especially. So, if I were to ask most senior centers what business you're in, you would say, you know, I, I'm in the education, I, educational services, or social services, or socialization, or congregate meals, or home delivered meals. Almost always, people describe their business in terms of the services that they provide. Rule number one is you need to get out of the business of providing services. Uh, and that's the wrong business to be in. It's a dead-end business. And if you stay in that business, you will become a dinosaur. So instead, you need to get into the outcomes business, the business of producing results. And there are lots of examples, but to me, the, the, the clean, a simple one is uh, people who say, I'm in the business of uh, providing home-delivered meals. How many of you would say that? You would have said that before I told you not to say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the problem with that is then you're in, as you're trying to grow your business, you're saying, who else can I get to buy home-delivered meals? So you go and you try to, you know, Meals and Wheels does a great job of talking about how important it is. And you go try to get more grants and more government support. And maybe you get a little bit, but you're limited. But instead of saying you're in the business of uh, providing home-delivered meals, you said, I'm in the business of improving the health and well-being of people who are homebound. Then you rethink what might you do when you're delivering that meal. What other things could happen during that same, what might be on the tray? What might the volunteer do? And it shifts to the possibility that lots of people, particularly healthcare, are interested in the health and well-being of people who are homebound, are interested into those homes into which you are going. So the all traditional approach uh, would be to say that you provide services and activity to people at our centers and in meals to homebound older adults. This is a very common uh, de description of a senior center. It's the transformational approach would be to say that you improve the health and well-being of older adults in your community. And that allows many other kinds of people to say, well, who else cares about improving the health and well-being of older adults in the community? That brings in health care, it brings in businesses, all sorts of people that say, we have that same goal, how might we work together, how might we have some kind of a partnership opportunity? The second uh, really important issue that many senior centers 
face is clarifying their target population. Uh, sometimes it should we be in the business of low-income seniors or all seniors? How many of you have wrestled with that issue in your centers? Few of you, okay. Um, how, another one is, are we in the business, which population are we trying to serve? Is it the baby boomers? Is it the older adults? Is it the oldest adults? Uh, both of these are part, well, do you have other target population issue in terms of geography? Do how far do you go in your program? Right. Yeah. How how far or how narrow or far is that geo? All these are really important questions and essential questions, I think, for for people to wrestle with. The traditional approach would be we serve vulnerable and disadvantaged seniors, most of whom can't afford to pay for our services. How many of you would, in a moment of supported self-reflection, would say, yes, that's us? Okay. The transformative approach would be to say, no, we serve all baby boomers and older adults who can benefit from what we do. Uh, and the problem is, if you say we're in the business of only afford, basically serving the people who can't pay, who we get grants and support from, what that's going to mean is that other people will come in and meet the need. Uh, and as a result of that, you will be weaker. Uh, a good example of this was in visiting in uh, Mesa, Arizona, um, a senior center where a nice center which had a big a uh, map on the wall of the, of the Arizona County and it had about 250 red dots. 250 what are all these dots? And he said, these dots are um, a home delivered meals client. And I said, well, what are the red dots? He said, the red dots were the uh, pro people who were funded under the Older Americans Act and county funds and we had enough money to provide 250 people a day with meals. And I said, what happened? He said, well, what would happen is people would call up and they'd say, I need a home delivered meal or a home delivered meal for my mom. And they would say, okay, we'll put you on a waiting list and you know, it'll be about 30 to 45 days and you can get a meal. And the people would say, well, but I need a meal now. I don't need a meal in 45 days. Uh, so then they said, well, can we buy a meal? And they said, well, gee, okay. And they thought about it and they realized that they could price um, Still whistling? All right, you guys are very supportive audience. I appreciate that. Uh, so, I'm with the story. So, they said, okay, they started providing meals, and all of a sudden they went from 200 to, to 400 people buying meals. But something more than that happened, because they actually they priced it at cost. If they'd priced it a little bit more, they could have made some money. But you learn from the lesson. But something else happened. The private pay people started to say, well, it's nice that you deliver hot meals, but I don't necessarily want to eat when you want me to. So couldn't you give it to a microwavable meal? And they thought about it and said, yeah, we could, because most of the private pay had microwaves, but not all the subsidized clients had microwaves. But they figured out a way and they went to a, a company and they went and they got a donation so they could put microwaves in the everybody's home so they would have microwavable meals. But then the people, the private pay people said, well, it's great that you deliver meals five days a week, but after you eat seven days a week, can't you deliver three meals or more on the weekend? So they started to do that, and then they started to offer it to everybody. And then the, um, the private pay patients called up and said, you know, the succotash is really bad. Can't you give us a better vegetable? <laughs> and so now the subsidized clients wouldn't, pay, wouldn't complain, but the other people did. So the succotash and the vegetables got better. And so all of these are examples of how by opening the service to everybody who could benefit from it, they uh, got more money, more revenue, more economies of scale, and they started to get the consumer-driven innovation that comes from that. 
Uh, so the the old model is not also that the client, older adults are clients or service recipients. We give them what they need. We know what they need. The new model is uh, their their customers, uh, and they they need to be empowered, and we need to listen to them to to survive. So clarifying your target population, and I think broadening your if you're not already saying anybody who can benefit from what you offer you should allow and you should allow them to pay you for it uh, to me is all part of the necessary uh, evolution to a more a thriving center and how many of you want baby boomers into your program how many of you don't want baby boomers in your program okay how many of you just don't like to raise your hands <laughs> okay all right so if you, you know, I'm going to cut to the chase, gazillion dollars worth of market research and all of this thing about what is it that baby boomers want. And how many of you, how many of us are baby boomers? Okay, so we're going to do a test. I'm going to tell you what they are and you tell me if it resonates. Bottom line, baby boomers want to have fun and they want to be healthy. How many of you want to have fun and want to be healthy? Okay, this is what sells. This is what people buy. This is what people buy things that you don't even work, but they buy them because they promise that they'll be healthy. All these people sign up for Lumosity, not to single them out. That's his brain game, because I think it's going to improve their brain function, and what it does is improve their ability to play the game. Uh, but still, they pay because it, they want, they're willing to pay for things that will make them feel healthy. So that's what they want. And the third thing they probably want is some more financial security if they're, if they're worried about their money. Um, what do baby boomers need? Now if you ask the experts, which of all of you, what we hear consistently is that they need guides to help them navigate longer lives. And by the way, both of these things are not just for me, that Ken Dykewall, Colin Milner, a lot of people in this field are saying these things. I, don't, I didn't want to I think this is all my thoughts on these kinds of things. But what people need is, you know, uh, life is a river. Now that analogy, and you, we need guides in this river. As we go through the phase of life, we start as a pretty gentle river, start to get a little rockier, start to get a more rocky, the, ra the rapids come in life, and then we go off the cliff. <laughs> How many of you are surprised about the fact that we go off the cliff at some point? <laughs> many of us lead our lives like this is a big surprise. Uh, but there, we make more decisions uh, in these last third, 25 years of life than we did in the first 50 years or so of life. We didn't make that many decisions growing up. We know maybe, you know, should we go to college or not? Should we get a job? Which job? Or stay home, raise a family? Who to have a partner with and when to retire? I mean, maybe to buy a house. So five or six decisions, important decisions. You make a lot of decisions uh, in the last third of life in terms of where you're going to live, how you're going to pay for things, what are you going to do with your time, how do I deal with this chronic illness, that chronic condition, what do I do, how do I help my caregivers. There's a tremendous amount of decision making that goes on uh, and it's all new to us. The first time we experience hearing loss, it's all new to us even though 35% of us are going to experience hearing loss, the first time we all start to get frail or muscle loss. Everything that happens is new to us as individuals, but is very predictable on a population level. And what people need, even though they don't always recognize it, they need somebody to help them, to help them sort through, to figure out how to make these choices. So herein lies um, the key transformation. Give the market what they want and they need. If you can package these things together, you have solutions that I think can help you thrive. The traditional approach is we provide social services to people in need. The transformational approach is we provide fun ways to be healthy and navigate longer lives. If you can figure out how to make this shift, you've started to create 
something that is attractive to more people, is broader in what you're doing, and frankly, is more fun. Uh, and, and it's not in lieu of helping providing people with social services they need. It's a broader, more expanded uh, array of programs and services. The next one, this is one of the new ones, uh, is pay attention to your brand. What is the brand of senior centers? This brand of senior centers, as talked about in that Forbes article, is essentially people who are uh, frail uh, and who play bingo. You know, we may not like it, but that was what Forbes said. That's what people say. That's what a lot of community residents say. I don't want to go to that center. You know, I'm 85, but that's for the old people. I'm not old yet. Uh, and nobody, even frankly, people who are frail don't see themselves in that way. So we've got a brand problem, and the issue is nonprofits never pay any attention to brands. They figure it's too expensive, I don't know how to do it. You have to pay attention to your brand. We learned this at NCOA as well. So the aspirational brand is that my place is this place to be healthy and have fun. Now this is an extreme, and this isn't quite what actually happened. Uh, <laughs> But this is what you want. You want to, that this is an inviting place. This center is creating a different brand. You walk in, you see it, you see older people who are vibrant, you see things happening, it's a beautiful space. We have to, all of us have to recognize that we have a brand, whether we like it or not. The approach is that we didn't pay attention to it, and it's a place for those other people, not for me, at least not now, and I wouldn't have a good time going there. That's the brand that we're counteracting, focusing on the brand and your desired perception and you want people to say, this is a fun place where I can go and learn things, stay active, and make new friends. And it's for me, it's not just for those old people, older people. By the way, one of the things I do, even though I did it here, is I didn't do it here, is I don't talk about older people. I talk about baby, baby boomers, don't think you're talking about them. If you say baby boomers, I know you mean me because I've been growing with that identity. So just a, a little uh, tip right there. The next goal, by the way, I should have said this at the beginning, I don't expect many of you doing many of these things, but I hope that of this whole thing you'll come up with one or two that resonate for you, and that will be a, a, a great success. Commit to a big, hairy, audacious goal. This is something that we've learned at NCOA is really important. Uh, the traditional uh, approach is if, if most senior centers don't have a big, most nonprofits, don't have a big, hairy, audacious goal. You know, they're in the business of helping people, uh, and maybe they have a goal, like, you know, to increase participation by 10%, but they don't have a moonshot goal. They don't say, this is something we're gonna do over the next eight to 10 years. I'm not really sure how I'm gonna do it, how, but I know it'd be really wonderful if I could. So the traditional approach would be to have no big BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal. A transformational approach would be to have your own version of a moonshot. And there, every helps all baby boomers and older adults to age well in our community. I suspect that's not too far from the vision of, of the Mill Race Center, probably in different words. Or we will connect with and engage 75% of the older adults in our community each year. Something that's big, something that you know to do something that, well, the point of this is you cannot transform yourself if you're going to do the same thing over and over again. You have to be thinking about ways to do things. And for us, you know, we went into this and we weren't sure. We're halfway through the period. We reported to the goal, our board to the goal that we had uh, helped about 4 million people. We saw a clear path to getting to 8.2 million by 2020, which was pretty good, but it also meant we had another 1.8 million people to figure out how we're going to do that. And we've got a team of people thinking about that and I'm quietly confident that we will beat our goal without, although I can't tell you exactly how we'll get there, but that's the power of a transformational objective. It creates energy and it creates excitement. Uh, the other thing you need to do is change your business models. Well, many of us need to, including NCOA. The traditional approach was that we would get grants and contracts, provide restricted revenues, maybe do some fundraising on the side, 
and also uh, and that we would pretty much price things based on cost. We're so used to getting government and contracts and grants that uh, we, they, is a cost-additional approach says that we also earn unrestricted revenue by delivering unique value and producing compelling outcomes. If you can keep people healthy, if you can keep people out of nursing homes, if you can keep people uh, from emergency room visits, uh, those are outcomes that people will pay for. It may take a while to figure out all the mechanics of it, but that's if you can create energy and excitement and engagement in people to participate in the community and more activities, those are things of value to people. So it's a transformational approach to say we're not just going to get grants and contracts, but that we're also going to be more entrepreneurial by providing things that people need and that people will pay for. I hope always with a, the, the idea of scholarship for those who can't pay, but recognition just because you want to have scholarship for people who can't pay, it's not a reason not to charge people who can pay, and just the opposite there. The second thing is, got to get this out of our head, this cost-based pricing, there isn't a business in America uh, that thrives on cost-based pricing. You know, uh, you can't. <laughs> I don't know why in the nonprofit sector we think we can. Uh, you know, I once had um, Tiny Nunn, uh, who was the uh, uh, head of the Little Sisters of the Poor Hospital uh, in Portland, in Oregon, and she said to me, Jim, uh, no margin, no mission. Uh, and that's true. No margin, no mission. There is nobody in America or nobody in your community who knows better what to do with unrestricted money than you do. I absolutely, totally believe that if a funder came to you and said, here's $10,000, do what you want, what do you want to do with it, you would come up with something more creative, better, and transformational than almost any request for proposals I've ever seen. So we have to change our business models, get you to the point where you have revenues to uh, do what you know, do what you want to do, achieve your BHAGs, and move forward. I don't know why. The next thing, if I can figure out how to move this. Okay, this is really important, uh, I think. They're all important. Um, the old model of social services, and certainly the old model of senior centers, is to get help, you come to our storefront, you come to our facility. We are in the business of helping people, with the social workers, with the staff, in person, in our facility. That, because of our limitations and resources, because there's so many more people, that model is not sustainable as the primary or, or certainly the only way to help people. The model of shifting, whether it's people to learn things, whether it's people to navigate all of these things we've uh, talked about that we know they're going to experience, even if they don't know them yet, uh, is that we need to use bricks and clicks. Bricks meaning uh, physical spaces, clicks meaning the internet, and those kinds of, uh, of, of com uh, con connectivity so that those who can, can help and learn themselves. That's number one. Number two is anybody who cares about that person, family members, children, social workers, financial planners can access and help people. And that our job, at least on the social services side, is to help those who can't be helped in any other way. It's the traditional approach of our senior centers is we provide services in our facilities and in their own home. The transformational approach, and there are really two aspects of this. One is we use the internet to engage and empower people throughout the community to help themselves and others. And the second part is we bring our programming out to where people are, not just that people come to our center. The best way 
you can get people to come into your center is to offer some attractive, fun programming outside where they already are, and then say, by the way, now that you've had this wonderful experience, we've got this great facility or the Zumba class or all these educational programs here. We cannot be insular either in terms of just serving our facility. We have to be a resource for the community and we have to take advantage of the fact that you have knowledge, insight, program, and sometimes the best way to reach people is by making that available online, not just requiring people to come to your center. Another one uh, where uh, we had, I know we had a great session with um, Marcy and Lynn Harris is uh, combining service and advocacy. Uh, I've heard uh, policymakers say several times is that we, uh, uh, you know, you have lobby, lobbyists and people who spend a lot of money in political action uh, committees, but we always, we consistently underestimate the power of our voice. You are credible, uh, trusted people. You understand the issues, uh, and when you speak, you speak uh, with a credibility that very few people in your community have. Yet most of us either think we're not supposed to advocate, or we're not allowed to advocate, or uh, that doesn't fit the image of who we are. Uh, and I think that's one of uh, the greatest untapped uh, forces for advocacy are both you and your participant, senior center participant. But so the traditional approach, either we wouldn't advocate or we'd only get upset about when meals are being cut. You know, when something very bread and butter, uh, which is okay, but what we really ought to be doing is being a force for good in our community. Organizing the people to advocate for more sc better schools or the environment or the issues that affect our community. So we'll talk about how that will change your brand if your senior centers are, are out there at City Hall uh, talking about um, you know, more childcare or more parks or uh, other kinds of issues. That will change your perception of who these folks are and what's going on in the com community. Not everything is poli not every solution is policy, but if we are not exercising our vocal cords in ways that uh, we can, and I encourage all of you to get involved and pay attention to NISC and policy agenda, NCOA and its policy agenda, but equally important, go beyond the, 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 to the self agenda, uh, interested agenda of our organization to talk about um, the broader issues in your community. And then, I, th I don't know if this is the last one, second to last one, is we have the greatest untapped resource we have is our participant, is the people who are in our centers, uh, and we need to just invest more and more in giving them the opportunity to empower, to do more, to take our programming to the next level. There are great sessions on this and other topics, but the traditional approach has been, yeah, we use older volunteers, and we, they supplement existing services as ancillary staff. You know, we have our programs and they make us, you know, they answer the phones, they uh, maybe are drivers, they maybe take things a little further. The other approach is, wow, we're sitting on this huge, largely untapped resource uh, that could be optimized to produce our outcomes, to achieve our BHAG, to strengthen our organization, and to strengthen our community. 45% of people between the ages of 65 and 74 volunteer. Another 45% say they would volunteer if somebody asked them. Uh, increasingly, the volunteer pool is retired professionals who want to work uh, in teams, uh, who want to work as part of projects. When you ask retired professionals what they miss most about work, they give you two answers. They say, we miss uh, working together in a team to accomplish something extraordinary. You know, we got together in a team, we did something, it was really great, uh, and we miss laughing at the boss, which is the, the shared experience of fun uh, and those kinds of things. 
if you can start to think of our volunteer pool as not just answer a step, but give them the job of figuring out how to achieve that big vision, how to connect in the community, creating experiences, there's a tremendous a billion a billion person years and you could probably figure out what that is in each of your communities but it's hundreds of thousands of people a year that's there uh, ready to be tapped if we can tap them. But another important strategy is to embrace social enterprises and business partnerships uh, you know, the traditional approach is that we get our money from the Old Americans Act, State and County United Way and philanthropy. Uh, the more transformational approach is that uh, we maintain government, we continue that, but we increase funding from entrepreneurial sources, whether it's the consumers, Medicare, or other kinds of partnership. You need to go beyond what you do to achieve a different result. We need to be uh, yeah, uh, more entrepreneurial, more business-like, not, not from a mission point of view. We need to keep that social justice, caring for everybody mission, but we have to understand no mission, no margin, no revenue, no staff, uh, no money, no nothing. So we need to find opportunities uh, to provide results consistent with your mission and services and programs, and it is doable but you almost have to embrace it because even in our own organization at NCOA when we started to try to move beyond the grants uh, and the contract and do businesses there was uh, mixed feelings, there was concerns, what are we doing, why are we doing this are we selling out? Uh, and what we've done is made sure that every business was entirely consistent with our mission so for example we would never be in the eco travel business because while we care about, you know, well-off people, that's not our mission to help well-off people figure out how to travel. On the other hand, we will be in the business of helping people make important decisions about Medicare or uh, in things that, that are consistent with our goal of improving the lives of 10 million people. I think that this is a cultural transformation uh, which is beginning to be more embraced uh, not everybody does, but and how many? I know some of you. How many of you have little businesses or being entrepreneurial in your senior centers? Okay, so about a quarter of us. So we can all learn from the rest of them. Another one is to form new networks to create value and tap into new revenue streams. The day of the individual solo practitioner doctor is gone. Uh, the day of the uh, individual senior center as a standalone entity always doing everything by itself that day that demise is coming it's not here yet but it, it, it's definitely coming so the old approach was that we're all on it for ourselves sometimes we compete sometimes we uh, cooperate with our other organization the, the approach of the future says that we're going to be a key part of regional and national network to achieve outcomes serve population and tap into new revenue stream. We have to create networks of centers. The ability to, even if you do produce great outcomes, improving health, uh, no insurance company is going to want to do business with you because you're too small. Uh, and the cost of figuring out all the systems to work with them is too complicated. But if you have a statewide network of organizations that can provide a service or a program, that's very attractive. You're providing reach, you're providing revenues, you're driving economies of scale. So look for networks, look for organizations in other geographies, whether it's the other part of town or across the state, and say, how can we work together to create a value proposition to tap into new revenues? And I think this is the last one, uh, is to lead your organization from good to great. Uh, though, how many of you are familiar with the work of Jim Collins and Good to Great? Oh, good. Uh, we drank the uh, Kool-Aid about 10 years ago at NCOA and I walked in one day um, because I just, I'd had a business background and business school uh, but then had been in the nonprofit sector and I read this book, it was 90, I think 30 pages, small book, uh, and it talked, it bridges the language between uh, the business sector and the social sector and it became, I felt around, and they probably thought I was Chairman Mao with my little red book walking around. I bought it for my board, they all read it, I bought it for the staff, 
uh, and then uh, about seven years ago, we made a commitment to going from good to great. Uh, and there are a lot of s steps in this, um, but it's really pretty simple. Uh, it's not simple, it's, it's a lot of work. But it comes from comparing research-based work by Jim Collin on comparing great organization to good organization. Uh, and what they found, first of all, number one rule, you cannot have a great organization without great people. And, uh, and the worst enemy of great people are pretty good people. You know, I mean, if they're really bad, that's okay. But when they're not uh, great, uh, you cannot be a great organization. And it's tough. And if you're in a municipal, municipal environment, it's even tougher. But you just have to realize, if you want to be a great organization, you have to have great people on the bus and get the not great people off the bus. So speaking of great people, I'd like the NCOA staff to stand up for a second. Because I want to thank, acknowledge them for their passion. Our number one uh, screen is, uh, when we hire people now, is passion for the mission. Uh, and it's actually pretty easy. I say, you know, why do you care about this issue? And if they say, I have a grandmother, or there are a lot of old people, I cross them off the list. If they say, you know, I was volunteering in a nursing home when I was 17, and I live with my grandparents, and you can tell passion. And passion for the mission is essential. Yes, they are really smart people. Yes, they are really hardworking people. Yes, they are really wonderful people. But it's a combination of skills and passion that makes them great uh, people. And it's my privilege to work with them. I just want to thank all of you for being part of the NCOA team. We have fun together, but we also uh, have the satisfaction of knowing that we are working along the way of transformational leadership. Now, I, could, I can and have given a long talk on good to great, so I won't now, but how, how many of your organizations have worked with the good to great framework? So I, could, I suggest some of you uh, contact each other. It really does work. It's great at the board level, especially because it, it, it moves the conversation beyond, well, we need to be more business-like, but we're not really a business, and, and shows how those two ideas can be blended into a social, social sector organization. So it's a traditional organization. We're a good organization. We do good work. Uh, the transformational approach, we're going to do whatever it takes to be a great organization. Uh, and we've tried to measure that in terms of finances, in terms of people, in terms of processes. And I'd say we're halfway through it, but I think we're uh, on the verge, you know, getting to that point where I think we'll be there in a few years. So to review all of this, there are 11 strategies. Get out of the services business into the outcome business. Rethink your pop target population. Focus on your brand. Have a BHAG. Change your business models. Click some bricks. Service and advocacy, empower older adults, embrace social enterprise, form networks, uh, and lead your organization from good to great. Now, I'm not going to, I'm just going to say these are all great. I hope you will find at least, raise your hand if you found at least one of these, so it's something that's useful that you think might be relevant to your work. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, I am not going to, although I could go on for now, because Bob mentioned that. Um, my capstone project is something called the Aging Mastery Program. And the reason that it's my capstone is because I love to do programs, uh, but also because I think it hits on many of these points. It's a comprehensive and engaging approach for aging well that makes it fun for people to do things that they need, and it's designed to fit into existing organizations, uh, senior centers, and elsewhere. It's based on the fact that there are on the the tenets that there is a science and art of aging well for any aspect of this. You can go find great literature on what people should do and how to do it, uh, but there's a huge gap between what people should do and what they do. Uh, it's based on the fact we also know how to get people to make behavior change. Think Weight Watchers, you know, weekly goal, peer support, rewards, etc. The third idea is the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts 60 years later. How many of you are Scouts? Good, a lot of them. 
Uh, well, the scout, what's scouting about? It's about teaching people who are entering a new phase of life skills, competencies, insight, and things that they need to know to get through that, do well in that phase of life. And you can break that down into things that you're in merit badges for. Uh, and the fourth idea is SNH Greenstein. Raise your hand if you remember SNH Greenstein. <laughs> the thing about this is, but, and if you don't, ask your parents. It, it's a generational thing. But most of the people, when you raise their head, also smile because we associate it with this token rewards as being fun. We don't care that we're paying 5% more for the food at the groceries because we've got these silly little stamps, we put them in books, we traded it in for a baseball bat or a, a toaster or whatever it was that people wanted. So why the reason, and we had a session on this, but the important things about this are that we did it with five great centers to co-create this program. Uh, three of, four of them which are here, Mill Race Center, uh, the uh, Newingtown of Newington, Connecticut, uh, Duxbury Senior Center and Center in the Park. Four of the original five parents of this program are in this room, uh, and so I acknowledge them, Diane and Lynn uh, and Bob, and, um, oh, Joanne's not here, but Massachusetts is here as well. Um, so with them, we've created this program. It's starting to spread rapidly. Uh, it was in uh, five centers about two years ago. It'll be in more than 125 communities by the end of the year. Uh, and we want to take this and work with any of you to bring this program to scale. But where we're going with this is we did, we put out a series of alpha tests. Now we're involving about 125 projects and five or 6,000 participants. And then we're, we're gonna go to scale for a million or more people uh, beginning in 2017. We'd love to work with you on this program. It, the curriculum covers um, many aspects of aging well and elective, and basically it's all the same. You come to the class, there's great 20 minutes of great educational content with a speaker, 20 minutes or 30 minutes of a group in discussions and activity, then you set goals for what you're going to do, and then you earn points for doing it, whether it's exercising, eating better, filling out living wills, etc. Uh, we have a turnkey program for this, but the main thing to help you do this, we want to partner with you. I think we probably got about a dozen new partnerships coming out of this meeting. But my main point for this is to say that this, and not just not about AMP, it's about other programs that can hit on several of these things. You don't need to take each one of these things as a separate strategy. You can look for programs which pull together a lot of them that, that help you produce outcome, broaden your population, improve your brand, change your business model, involve, get involved, go out into the community, engage people, etc. So I'd like to uh, conclude with just a, um, to say that I know that you guys are in this transformation process. It, you are leaders. You are, have come to this conference because you care, because you are doing these things. Uh, how many of you are doing at least one of these strategies already? Good, most of you are good. And, and we have to modernize. I think we have a moral imperative to mo modernize. We understand not only the challenges, but the tremendous opportunity, but we can uh, change things so that there will be a very different Forbes article in a few years from now. So what I, we would like to do at NCOA and NISC is to thank you for all that you do. We want to work with you to modernize and transform your centers in your community and nationwide. We want to help millions of baby boomers to navigate their longer lives. We want to amp up America. We want to help senior centers to thrive, and I thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you today.